very grateful this evening uh, to have with us uh, Justice Malala, who uh, many of you will know is a renowned political commentator, uh, newspaper columnist, uh, an author. Uh, he writes regularly for The Times, uh, for the Financial Mail, and all sorts of other publications around the world. Uh, you can find uh, Justice's name. So Justice, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And also a warm welcome to Stephen Hurtis, well-known and much respected TV and radio host, as well as political analyst, writing regularly for the Daily Maverick and presenter of uh, SAFM's morning show, SAFM Sunrise. You can hear Stephen uh, every morning. So I'm grateful to both of them. We know this is a very busy time as we run up to the elections. Uh, so I'm going to uh, begin straight away. Uh, we will do as we've done before. Uh, we will have a dialogue and then uh, we will invite you if you have any questions to put them into the chat uh, once we uh, get going. So feel free to use the chat function of Zoom uh, to put your questions in. Uh, Justice, I'm going to begin with you. Less than two weeks to go to uh, the election. Um, many people thought uh, two or three months ago this was going to be a very different election. Uh, it seems as if uh, that may not be true. Things might look like they uh, looked before. The ANC may not lose as much as what they the people were predicting. Uh, where do you see things going as you sit today looking at uh, the 29th of May? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for everyone for uh, coming on to the chat. Um, thanks for asking me to come and speak to you. I um you know, there's actually been several changes in this in this uh, election campaign. Before December 16, it was pretty much straightforward. The ANC is going to take a beating. Um, it will get to maybe 47 percent, 48 percent, and it will build a it will build a coalition, and uh, and life will go on uh, pretty much as it was before because that coalition partner would be a small, small one. And so there would be no impact on policy, uh, on the ANC's plans largely. It would be a bit like uh, what's happening with uh, Patricia DeLille. It would be a handover of, um, of a cabinet position, and that would be it. But December 16, for me, uh, changed everything. Uh, it changed the complexion of KwaZulu Natal um, because Jacob Zuma announcing that he, uh, first of all, supports uh, the 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 MK party then increasingly say no the MK party is my baby and then no actually I started it and I told this guy Jablani Kumali to go and register and so forth but whatever the machinations Jacob Zuma is a powerful powerful figure in KwaZulu Natal I think even with the problems that we've seen with the case that with the um, MK party the infighting the firings and so forth. Jacob Zuma remains a significant force in KwaZulu Natal. I think he also doesn't just eat into the ANC's disgruntled um, and, and all sorts of others. He also eats into he also eats into uh, into the EFF's uh, uh, support base. Um, he eats into uh, into the IFP support base. Uh, he's he's he he's using uh, Zulu ethnic mobilization to to just feed wherever he can in KwaZulu Natal. I don't think that he has as much support as he claims in Bumalanga, uh, Gauteng, other parts of the country. But in KwaZulu Natal, I think he's a significant force, no matter the problems that he may have. So so. That, that with two weeks to go, uh, I would say, for me, there are several certainties. One, um, the ANC will lose its outright majority in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. It was slim anyway in 2019, and this time it will, be, it will go low and quite low. Um, and that means that in KwaZulu-Natal, we might not talk about them at national level, but in KwaZulu-Natal, the ANC... The ANC may still come out ahead, but it will need coalition partners that are strong. There may be a coalition configuration that leaves the ANC out, and maybe it's MK party, DA, IFP, some sort of government of provincial unity. Um, in Gauteng, I think the ANC is also going to take a beating uh, because the ANC has been losing the, 
the urban lung of this country since 2016. Johannesburg is in is in only in the hands of the ANC because it jumped into bed with the EFF, um, um, city of Twane, Egrilene, and so forth. So two provinces that are going to be in real contention about building some form of uh, coalition uh, significant. That said, the ANC is on a definite pushback. Um, and many of you may have read uh, Stephen Spiritus's piece this morning, a uh, brilliant, brilliant piece of analysis. And it shows uh, just how the ANC has been pushing back using all kinds of people, Tabo Mbeki being brought back, Kalema Matlanta and others, uh, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, plus, you know, I mean, I have to tell you, when, when you go into work and listen to Stephen in the mornings, um, the ads that come on, uh, I'll point to one, the Minister of Transport uh, uh, has been, I didn't, well, except for the time when she got robbed by the side of the road, I didn't know who this person was until this election. She is now on every radio station, every half hour saying, look what we've done, the trains are running, the taxis are running, the streets are smooth, everything's okay, and so forth. So. So the ANC is pushing back, but I I think it will still, I think it will still come below fifty percent. Um, um, but I think at national level, it is likely that the ANC can build an easy coalition uh, with with one of the smaller parties. But Houting and Kaiserdan, I think, are gone for for the ANC. Thank Stephen, you. Stephen, the ANC. I can I can bang on all night, but. <laughs> I think I should stop and give others a chance. Okay, Stephen, the the ANC, uh, you know, it, it's it's a kind of um, machine that's very difficult to understand. It looked very divided, very, uh, yeah. you know, there were all sorts of factions. Suddenly, with such a short time to go, they seem to be, at least uh, from the outside, pulling things together to make things work for the election. Uh, as Justice mentioned, they brought mm -hmm. Mbeki back. Uh, I don't think Mbeki's campaigned. Since uh, since he yeah. came he came he left office, uh, how how are they doing this? What's going on inside the ANC? Is it is it just complete? Uh, you know, we've got to do something, guys. Or yeah. how do you see things uh, working there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just to sort of build on on Justice's analysis, because I don't I don't disagree. I think any of them, apart from the idea of a government of provincial unity in KwaZulu Natal, provincial unity in KwaZulu Natal, really, and that's a joke. Um, <laughs> So I would say several things. The first is that um, there's certain things that happen during elections. There's a sort of pattern. Everyone talks at the beginning of the year of an election. Everyone talks a brand new, about a brand new party. MK came along. Everyone talks about how well the opposition is doing and how badly the ANC is doing and how divided the ANC is. And then as things get closer and closer, people stop talking about the brand new party. And look, it's Jacob Zuma this time, so it is slightly different. Justice is right to say they'll do well. Um, um, people stop talking about the opposition, and the opposition's share of the vote in polling starts to go down. And people in the ANC all coalesce around the leader. And I mean, you'll remember during the Zuma years, um, how, you know, an attack on Zuma was an attack on the ANC. And during elections, you'd really say this. Greta Mantashe, when he was Secretary General, actually said during a debate around whether um, local elections should be merged into national elections, he, uh, he said he would argue against it from the ANC's point of view because the elections brought the ANC together. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what we see, is that this election is bringing the ANC together. And the ANC hasn't really been in sort of easily definable factions or interest groups for a while. It's been sort of swirling groups, really, um, possibly since 2017. Um, and so what we're seeing is the classic kind of thing of the ANC pulling together in all sorts of ways. You know, it is magical that um, that, that, that load shedding has stopped, I think, now for 52 days. Um, you are seeing a sort of alignment oh, of things. Scandals, all of the sort of scandals have disappeared. But what, what's really happening is that people are concentrating their minds and they're aligned and elections align yeah. everybody in the ANC. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And the other thing, by the way, Russell, is that campaigning works. And campaigning mm -hmm. isn't necessarily about trying to convince people to change their minds about who they're going to vote for. Campaigning is also about getting people who used to vote for you to turn out again to vote for you. Um, elections are won, as Hillary Clinton once put it, by people who show up 
And, and what you're seeing with the ANC is they're going in, they're saying to people, you need to vote for us again. Even Thabo Mbeki said, you know, look, we have problems, but, you know, voting for us is the right thing to do. It's a typical sort of Mbeki comment. And, um, and so suddenly you have the situation where, where the ANC share of the vote goes up. So it's not really surprising. Um, it does mean, it does give them certain options and coalitions, which we can talk about. And I still think, in my view, has always been that if you look at it, sort of you try and be an objective as rational as possible, which is quite hard to do in our politics. But after the election, the ANC is going to want to keep as much power as possible and govern um, with as free a hand as possible. And the way to do that is not to form a coalition with one small party, but to form a coalition with three or four small parties that get it to say 53, 54 percent. So no one of those small parties can take them out of power. And I think they're on track to do that. One last comment, by the way, if the polling which shows the EFF really has lost support to MK. And if the EFF is down to 10% and Julius Malema goes backwards in this election, the EFF could, the, the ANC could maybe remove the EFF from our politics in one move by simply saying publicly, we will never work with them again in any place, anywhere, at any time. And Julius Malema would suddenly be consigned to the opposition benches and he would lose all the political power he has. Sure. Justice? Um... Those small parties that Stephen talks about, uh, that uh, the ANC might consider uh, uh, going into coalition with, who would you say they are? Um, uh, I could have. I mean, I think the IFP. The IFP has been a fascinating thing for me uh, in the sense that if you think about the formation of the so-called multi-party charter, the Moonshot Pact, um, the IFP has always been very clear that oh, this idea that uh, I will never work with so and so, um, which the the which Action are saying in particular and the uh, the DA have touted about and even signed up on. The IFP has always been very clear that well, I mean, I'm waiting for the election result, and that's when I'll see who I can work with really. But I like mm -hmm. you, the MPC. So you know, we all together together. So I think the IFP is not just it's ready for the picking, it's ready for, it's ready to play. Um, I think people like Patricia DeLille continue to be around and we, we uh, you know, I mean, Stephen, I, I think uh, the, the tourism numbers came out the other day. Um, you know, she, she continues to, in a cabinet of laggards and incompetence and corrupt people, she continues to do pretty okay, you know? She, she reminded uh, she reminded me the other day that uh, when she came in, she stopped that one billion rand being handed over mm -hmm. to Tottenham Hotspurs, the the football club, <laughs> and and certainly the Cape is 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 very happy with uh, the fact that tourism numbers continue to flow to that to that province and maybe bits and pieces of other places, um, and she would be happy to play again. Uh, I think. I think a whole bunch of other smaller players would, would be would be happy with a deputy ministry here, a ministry there if they are uh, powerful enough. So, so I think in that sense there will be there will be no shortage of people saying pick me, pick me. Um, but that means that a, a very large um, uh, what do you call it cabinet is not about to become smaller. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa said, I'll, I'll shave it down when I come in after Zuma. It's actually gotten a little bit bigger, and it might become a little bit bigger uh, as uh, Stephen becomes a minister, I become a minister, Russell becomes <laughs> a minister, we all become ministers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stephen, and what do you think? I mean, which which of the parties, yeah. the smaller ones, I, I want to talk about the EFF yeah. and the DA, but which of yeah. those smaller ones do you think the ANC would be looking yeah. towards? I would look towards the older, more established, smaller parties. You're looking at the PAC, you're looking at the ZAPO. Um, and just to add to Justice's point about the IFP, a lot of the parties that seem to be campaigning against the ANC have really good reasons they could give their voters as to why they've done a deal with the ANC. And in the IFP's case, 
we would say we've been campaigning in the name of Prince Mangosuta Buta Lezi, who's passed, and uh, therefore uh, he wanted us to bury the hatchet. He wanted peace between the ANC and the IFP, and this is how we're doing it. Look, we're governing together. The last time this happened, Prince Buta Lezi was Home Affairs Minister and invaded Lesotho. So, you know, um, you, you give us a, a position and we can do it again. Um, that's a joke, but kind of. Um, and so, so there are lots of different options. Um, the other thing I must just point out is the power of patronage here. So if you're a minister mm. or a deputy minister, you get not just the salary, but you get a house in Joburg, a house, uh, you get a house in Swana and a house in Cape Town, you get a car in each place, usually German, um, you, you get a you get to um, you get free electricity, you get a free generator, more importantly, you get the diesel to run the generator, and you get eleven or twelve paid for government jobs. So if you're running a one person party that gets just enough you know, votes to get a seat. That's all of your top leaders taken care of or your family taken care of in a country with very high unemployment. So it's incredibly attractive. So Justice is right there. I mean, there's a sort of alphabet of smaller parties that would be very happy to do a deal uh, to get in, to get, to get in. And I mean, El Jamar would be first in line. Um, they've consistently voted with the ANC on almost everything. Um, so they would be first in line. Yeah, I'd, I'd say... Um... You know, I, I don't agree with Stephen on Azapo. I think this is the election that might wipe out the old party's yeah. liberation. Um, but but even th- th- think of it this way. Um, under Mbeki, uh, Cornel Mulder was the deputy minister of agriculture. I don't think Peter Hunneval today would would not see some kind of fandango possible between the FF plus and uh, and the ANC uh, in the mm-hmm. sense of self preservatory politics, the way they, they in the past said, you know, we are for farmers, and so mm-hmm. having Cornel Mulder as a as a deputy minister of agriculture guarantees certain an ear to the ground and into the powers uh, 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 configuration and so forth and so forth. So I I, I would say to you. Uh, we might think of them on the left or the center, but also on the right, it's it's not, it hasn't been impossible in the past. And I think with a Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, it's possible again. Uh, yes. So so I think I think those you you have quite a few going on. And I would say I I would venture that FF Plus has been growing. Uh, I think one of the more extra- extraordinary sides of this um, of this election, uh, uh, Stephen, you'll remember. I think in February they launched their manifesto in uh, in Pretoria in Swane uh, at at this massive centre. I'll tell you, there were so many black people. You wouldn't have thought mm-hmm. it's possible for mm-hmm. the F plus to attract that kind of uh, uh, support. And a lot of it from the Northwest, from the farming community, farming areas, and a lot of it anti-New South Africa sentiment that said, um, <laughs> this is extra, the whites yeah. did it better. Or it was better when, you know, the sure. likes of yeah. the yeah. leadership was doing it. So I, I think one of the surprises yeah. might be uh, the right of the DA in places like the Northwest hiving off mm. and turning on to the FF plus, which is what has happened in mm. uh, local elections and, 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 and in 2019, mm. and a bit of that former Bupita mm. type mm. vote coming in. It's not a lot, but it's there, I think. Yes, yes. And conservatism doesn't always have color. <laughs> you know, you see that you see that with people who support Donald Trump too. Conservatism isn't about mm-hmm. color. We see it in South Africa in that way, but it's not always about that. No, absolutely. Stephen, a lot of small parties, new, new, new mm-hmm. parties. You've got Rise Mzanzi, you've got Action mm-hmm. Essay, you've got Bosasa. In South African politics, these kind of new parties never really seem to get much traction. Is that yeah. because of the system of patronage you spoke about? Or, or how, how do you see that? Why is it that, you know, they don't seem to, I mean, we, if we think of COPE as well, it never mm-hmm. really got mm-hmm. much traction. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating to me that up until this point, so 30 years after, after liberation, the top four, the biggest four political parties all have their roots in apartheid, have mm-hmm. all of their roots mm-hmm. in that era. So, you know, it's the ANC, it's the DA, 
Um, it's the IFP and the EFF all have their roots there. This is beginning to change, though, I think. And what you're really seeing is the sort of breakup of, of the ANC, the breakup of the DA too, by the way, into kind of the Freedom Front Plus and the DA and the referendum party in, in Western Cape. Lord help us. Um, and so you have all of these things happening at the same time. And so there's a sort of splintering away from these four parties into different things. I mean, you could argue that that um, that MK is a splinter from the ANC and sort of the IFP. You know, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. It's quite messy. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is that the old of the sort of dominance of the big parties uh, coming out of the ANC, coming out of the apartheid era, is slowly giving away. The old is slowly dying. And the new is slowly being born in the shape of your Rise and and your bosses. So a kind of politics that's not defined by race. So uh, Action SA, Borsa, Rise and Zanzi aren't defined by race. They get support from white people and black people. Um, they're defined to an extent by class. I would say they're defined to an extent by, uh, by, by their urban identity, I would say. Although I think I think the Eastern Cape may surprise us a little bit for, for Rise and Zanzi. They've been active, very active there. And some Gezo Zibi is from there. Um, so, so, so you're seeing our politics changing in lots of different ways. And the splintering is going to become much more apparent in 2029. We spoke to um, Professor uh, Stephen Friedman, and he said, you know, one of the mm. problems that we have is we have this idea of a kind of DA-dominated coalition or an ANC-dominated coalition, when really um, the structure, proportional representation, the way in which we vote, normally leads to coalitions where no one party has above 25% of the vote. I think you're Germany, Scandinavia, much of Europe. Um, and that part might well be happening. Um, it will take a while, it does take a while, um, but, but maybe 10 years from now, we'll get to a point where no one party gets above, say, 30% of the vote. Now, that means that the DA is probably plateaued, you know, that they don't get more than that. Um, it probably means that the ANC is really going and that the, the, the floor for the ANC might well be 25, 30 percent. That's a long way to go um, and obviously won't happen in this election or even the next. But it does mean that if our politics is heading in that way, a few things start to happen. The one is that no one can ever sort of oppress us. You know, South Africa is never going to be a sort of Zimbabwe kind of style thing that I can see in any way. Mm -hmm. It does mean decisions don't get made. And then what really worries me um, is that people go into coalitions only to keep power. So there's no mm. coherent ideology. It's a bit like when the EFF voted for the DA, you know, in Joburg and Tswane and Kurleni. It doesn't make sense. We all know it doesn't make sense. And what that means is that our problems are never really solved. It becomes all about power. And you see that in many other places. You see it in Kenya time and time and time again, where people are only interested in power. And that that's that's kind of one of the quite likely scenarios for South Africa, which worries me. There are worse scenarios, by the way. So, I mean, I'm not that worried. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if we want, um, Stephen, I, I, I was wondering as you were speaking, if we want, if we actually want, um, how do I put it? Do we want, maybe it's a good thing that nothing, nothing changes. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain yes. myself. Um, if, uh, uh, let me take something like yesterday, the president signs uh, NHI into law. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Stephen, I'm sorry that you hear about this all the time. I'm from Hammanskral, just north of Pretoria. Uh, many of the Catholics in here will remember uh, St. Peter's uh, 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 just north of, uh, in Hammanskral near Temba. Now, the hospital right next to where, uh, um, the St. Peter's was, is Jubilee Hospital. When I, and I'm dating myself, when I was 18, I got a scholarship to go to university. I could go to a clean hospital. This is under apartheid. This is under Bukwita, so on, blah, blah, blah. I could go to a clean uh, uh, Jubilee mm -hmm. Hospital and get um, a plethora of tests so that my, aptly my bursary could be said that, you know, he's all good, mm -hmm. you can go to university. Now, I went to I went to a Jubilee Hospital on Saturday. There the are rats running across. The, in in the, it's 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 terrible. It's terrible to watch mm. you turn there and you think, how can this have patience in it when it's like this? Yeah. I Ramaphosa went to uh, Hammanskral when at the height of the cholera pandemic. We, yeah. Remember, we are supposedly have defeated. 
uh, cholera in this country. And yet people died in Haman's trial, at least 23, maybe 35 have died of cholera. Now, Cyril Ramaphosa went and addressed the stadium and people love him there. And he is, he says, um, um, we've set up Jubilee Hospital as the regional center to deal with any, if you have the symptoms, go there and da, da, da. People started shouting mortuary, 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 as in mm. everyone in Hammond's trial will tell you, if you get admitted to, Temba, to Jubilee Hospital, you're mm. going to die. This, you sure. get a tender infection and so forth and so forth. Mm. So maybe I don't want an NHI, but mm. I want a Jubilee Hospital that works. I want a, uh, in my, in my, the village I grew up in, in New Year's US, there was a clinic. And it worked and it referred me to Jubilee Hospital when I was a kid and when other people were there. Maybe that's what I want. Instead of a situation where there are these grandiose uh, statements about we will do this and they're ideological and so forth. Maybe we will concentrate on fixing um, stuff that needs fixing and making things work where they need to work. I don't, I, you know, my idea of an NHI would be, uh, or for my mother and for my sister, would be a new Easter's clinic that works and a Jubilee hospital that works because they are near and they've always been for that community in the 70s, 80s when I was growing up there. Um, and they worked, uh, to, maybe not to the extent that they should be, but I have to, I have to say largely, um, the people of Hamanskral will tell you that this was a better system. So, so I don't know if you want these grandiose changes and 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 yes. you know, what what happens. And maybe we can co we can coalition and coalesce around around delivery. Mm. Just deliver the things, mm. the basic things that people want. Thank you. And and can I add on that, Justice? Because you know, I think to add it in a little bit. Um, Change can often lead to a huge amount of resistance, but if the change is very slow, so if, you know, the ANC loses power, I mean, there was a, you'll remember how many columns we had to write when people would ask, will the ANC give up power peacefully? And the mm. answer was always the ANC that gets to 50 or 49% is the ANC of today. It's weak. It's divided. It kind of likes its leader. It kind of doesn't. has no idea who's going to lead after Sir Ramaphosa. Um, so there's no prospect of the ANC fighting for that extra 2%. Because it just can't do it. Um, also because our system's too transparent and the media's too strong and all of these things. Um, and the courts work. But what that means is that as you give up power slowly and things change slowly, all of the problems associated with a big, quick change fall away. And that's very important. I think that is important. I want to come back to uh, the EFF. Stephen mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> We, we we remember that grandiose affair with uh, Malema being uh, uh, lifted up and the th hundreds of thousands of people that were there. You suggest that there that there could be a decline uh, in the year. Where is that mm. decline coming from? What what's going on there? So I mean, this is from a poll, and look, just a word about polling. You'll be very careful with polling. You know, every politician will tell you the only poll that matters is the one on the election. Day, and they're not wrong to say that, but polling is interesting. Um, I think there, I think there are a few things. I would say before MK, I had a few questions about whether Julius Malema was running out of momentum, and I based that on the fact that during the local government election, at a time when we were just coming out of COVID, when youth unemployment has probably never been higher in South Africa, um, when so many people had lost so much, when there was so much legitimate anger on the ground, when load shedding was so bad. But he could not seem to properly increase his share of the vote. And I wondered if this was a sign. Now, you could be careful with local elections. You've got to wait to see what happens in national elections. But on the ground, he has not been able to dominate the kind of national discussion for a while. And there are a few other things within the EFF that sort of matter. Some of the senior people who are around him have left. And this is really his big problem, that he's never been able to um, grow leaders. So it's really still him and Floyd. And, you know, to an extent, mm. to an extent, Dr. Vicini and Lawsy. But I mean, you know, name four other EFF leaders out of that. And, and, you know, I follow politics professionally and I could do it, but it's, but it's tricky, you know, because, and mm. this tells you something. That said, I mean, the politics of performance really, you know, that, that was a big event that he had at the FND Stadium. He then launched his 
his manifesto in KwaZulu-Natal. And, you know, three of the four biggest political parties launched their manifesto in the same stadium. The Moses Mabidia Stadium in Durban, it was the EFF, it was uh, Julius Malema, it was the IFP. Um, but then... And the fact is that he was focusing on KZN. He wanted to take votes from the ANC and KZN. And I think Jacob Zuma came along and literally took his lunch and was sitting in the corner and eating it. Um, he literally just is taking votes from the EFF. If, you, if you're in KZN and you're interested in radical change, you might well go for Zuma rather than for Julius Malema. And this is a real problem for Julius. Um, so I think for all of those reasons, he might have lost momentum. It's hard to say at this stage. And yeah, Julius Malema, without the prospect of doing any kind of deal with the ANC, is quite a weak figure. You know, he's on just under 12% of the national vote. His power comes to an extent, and I, Justice may disagree with me on this, let's see, um, comes from the fact that he could force the ANC to do a deal with them. That's the only, that's the only place where his power comes from. So if the ANC takes that for, off the table, like the whole game changes around Julius. I mean, I, I think it's amazing that in a country where uh, the, the unemployment numbers came out uh, two days ago, three days ago, um, and, and um, joblessness is on the up. Um, mm -hmm. If numbers like that came out in many, many other jurisdictions uh, with 10 days to go to an election, I would say to you, Cyril Ramaphosa is toast. I would mm -hmm. say... Julius Malema, who speaks to the 64% unemployment, uh, young, unemployed young people, is, should be the rising star and, and, and coming through, but, but it's not happening. Um, so, so, you know, there is a failure on the part of the ANC, and it's extraordinary, but there is a failure on the part of the, of the, um, of the opposition here. How, how can we have such an incredible uh, number of jobless people and still not see people essentially saying I'm moving away. And maybe, you know, we can have a chat about, about uh, the SRD, the 350 rand grant, the child grants and all the other social uh, grants that we, we pay out and so forth. Perhaps that's where it is, but, but it's, it's quite a failure on the, on the part of this revolutionary movement that those young people are not coming out and voting for it. But but at something at a structural level, at an organizational level, I mean, uh, is the is Julius Malema's dictatorial tendencies, if you will. Where I am tonight in KwaZulu Natal, he he essentially fired the entire top structure because they did not um, they did not organize and pay for buses at an individual basis to come to that, um, the rally you speak about with a, mm. with a forklift or whatever it was that he used. Um, and so you had all these activists and there were, there were more than a hundred of them who were told you are a, an, an MP or a, a local councillor, and you didn't uh, pitch up with a bus full mm. of people. And so, no, no, you know, not even listening to you, it was like you're mm. out. Mm. Um, in Limpopo, essentially the same thing happened, and you had these scenes of a thousand uh, EFF people being marched to the ANC office saying, we're going home, we've had enough of this. So, so his own organizational structure in KwaZulu-Natal mm. has been undermined by, by what he did. Uh, uh, Limpopo, where he had quite, and he still has, quite a sizable number of people. Uh, these these kinds of acts um, are beginning to show that you actually need an organization to run a campaign, and he he, he doesn't have it. So I think mm -hmm. those, um, you know, I, I think women will think a lot, uh, women voters will think a lot about the fact that Naledi Chira, uh, some of you may remember her, She's one mm. of the four young women who stood at the 2016 elections um, yes. um, and protested at a, against Jacob Zuma. And she went on to be an MP. She's had two run-ins with, with Julius Malema. And one of them was because she worked until the day she went into labor. Um, 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 she was punished 
for not having informed the right person that her child is sick and so she can't vote in the chamber and had to go home. Yeah. And people are like, what, what kind of, you know, sweatshop yeah. is this? Uh, is this a political party or not? If I was a workerist or you know, a trade union um, member, I'd be, I'd be asking myself, oh, oh what's yeah. going on? So I think all those things plus, uh, you know, a large chunk of what, what Stephen said uh, contributes to that. Justice, I know that you have to go in just a couple of minutes. I, I, there's so many questions to ask. I, I want to just ask about the DA. Uh, you, you, the DA seems to have squandered every opportunity, in my opinion, that they've had. I mean, the, the flag thing is just, you know, almost, uh, you know, a cherry on top of so many other things that they've done. What, what's your sense of what's going on in the DA? I mean, they also seem to be in decline. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a... I, I look back to, well, how the how was the ANC formed? The ANC was formed by essentially, you know, under apartheid, we were told the ANC are communists and so forth. They were actually black liberals who formed the ANC. Mm -hmm. uh, an Oxford trained lawyer, a newspaper editor from KwaZulu Natal, these people who wrote each other letters, having feuds and all kinds of things. They were... You know, they didn't even believe in, in uh, one person, one vote. They believe that you have to have property and, uh, and a degree or a, a form six uh, to vote. You know, there were, there, were, there were DA people. And I think the DA needs to deal with race. Um, I, I think that mm. if you have Musima Mane, Hemen Mashaba, uh, uh, so many, uh, I mean, there's a brilliant young guy from KwaZulu Natal, Bongani Baloy, uh, not from Midval. A, a municipality, the only Gauté municipality that was run for more than 10 years by the DA, Midval was run by Bongani Baloi, two, um, um, not just two, actually more than two um, um, clean audits in succession, people like Heineken investing in that, in that uh, uh, town because he ran a good, a very good uh, mm. town. And what happens? He decides to walk out of the DA because he doesn't feel at home as a black person. He's not the only one. The DA continues to do these things. If you ban the South African flag, quite frankly, it's a it's it's you're just trying to be a smart aleck. And 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 I think I think it blows up again and again in their faces. Uh, and and it shows a party that's just not not even prepared to change, a party that's prepared to say, I'm in South Africa, and actually it hurts a, it hurts a strong as ZB, it hurts a Muslim man, it hurts um, a, a, it hurts an, a, a Herman Mashaba, that this flag that represents the times of all of us over party, um, that they, I don't need to do this, but they do it, and, and, and I think that conversation is something that's not being had in the in the DA. And I think it will continue to be a fundamental problem. You have to ask yourself, why is Bosa, why are all these people not in, I apologize, um, why are all these people not in the DA? They should be. There are DA people. There, are, there is no difference between them ideologically or any other way. They shouldn't be outside. Justice, thank you very much. And I'm a man of my word, so it is 20 to 8 if you need to go. Um, thank, you so <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for Cheers, your, your time and your insights tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Stephen, the DA, your, your <laughs> thoughts? Mm. Look, um, every, for the last three election campaigns or so, the, ANS, the, the DA has tried to do something, there I use the word, incendiary, um, uh, to try and grab the, the attention. And I think their logic goes like this. But elections are won and lost by the playing field on which you play. So in other words, what is the election going to be about? What are people going to be talking about? And if you can decide what people are talking about, you win. Julius Malema has done this brilliantly many times, by the way. And I think maybe one of the reasons he's lost momentum is he's lost the ability to do that because he can no longer shock. And we all know what Julius Malema is, you know, about that tactic. So what they try to do... Um, if you go back, I think it was 2016, they had an advert of a young woman going into a polling booth and hearing the voice of Nelson Mandela in her head and voting for DA. Um, you had during the 2021 <laughs> elections in Phoenix, um, you had the ANC calls you racist, the DA calls you heroes. Hectic thing to say. 
Um, and now you have this advert. It's important to remember the ads, the, the flags put together at the end, by the way. Um, and I mean, I don't want to defend the ANC, the, the DA, but I understand their point when they do that. And I think they're trying to, trying to make the conversation about, is the country on fire? That's the conversation they want to have. Now, I must just make a point, and I spoke about turnout earlier, um, is that if you look at KwaZulu-Natal at the moment, how finely balanced things are there. So there are four parties that could get above 20%. I mean, that's incredible. We've never really had something happen like this in a province in South Africa before. So MK could get above 20%, the ANC, the IFP, and the DA all could get above 20%. Now, if you look at, say, Etiquini, right? Durban, biggest sort of area in terms of numbers. And look at all those suburban areas. These are ratepayers associations who say we're no longer going to pay rates because the services are so bad. The DA needs to give them a reason to vote for the DA. And it's about that. And make no mistake, if the DA can drive turnout among those people in KwaZulu-Natal, you go from 19% to 23%. You help the IFP a little bit, and suddenly the multi-party charter movement is governing in KwaZulu-Natal. So there is calculus here. I don't like the calculus, but I mean, it's political calculus. Um, so it's driven by politicians. We don't have to like them. Um, and so there's a deliberate attempt. There's, there's logic here, is my point, is that there's something actually underpinning this. Um, and so this is why it is. And just to say, all politicians do bad things during elections. Sir Ron Paul's signing the NHI yesterday, frankly, was beneath him, actually. <laughs> you know, um, you know, sort of out of character. Furo Hafiji put it very well, I think, when she said it's just not his style. I thought that was a very good way of putting it. Um, he said earlier this year that you need to vote for the ANC to protect social grants. I mean, what nonsense is that? Um, um, you know, so, so I mean, you know, Julius Malema said terrible thing after terrible thing. So, like, politicians do this. So we need to sort of put it in quite a context. It's still wrong, by the way, but we should put it in a context. While, we, while we're on the DA, and I see there's a lot of questions coming through, uh, th their majority in the Western Cape, any thoughts about that? Yeah. Do you think they're going to hold on to that majority in the Western Cape? Uh, yeah, they'll get sort of 50 or thereabouts. If they fall below, they'll do a very easy deal. You know, the, the DA's had some, um, um, pa some parties it's been in coalition agreements with from 2006. So it's easy to do a deal with the Freedom Front Plus or the ACDP or the IFP mm. or any of the you know, Action SA or any of those those people in Cape Town. And what they would probably do in Cape Town, uh, just to give it a chance, is do a deal with the multi-party charter movement to get them a nice, safe majority and to practice co-governance. They would want to practice it, to say, look, this is what we can do in the rest of the country. So that would probably be the most likely outcome there. I'll go to some of the questions that are coming through. Um, Debbie's asking, if not the ANC in Gauteng, who do you think will win or which coalitions are likely in Gauteng? It's a good question. I mean, there's a mathematical chance, a very slim one, but a mathematical chance that the ANC and the EFF together don't get to 50% in Gauteng. Um, look, I don't know what combination of parties without those two would be able to form a coalition. It would have to involve every other party, you know, so the multi-party charter movement plus. But it is probably the ANC. And, and Banyaza Lesufi, I'm sure, wants to do a deal with the EFF. But even in Joburg last night, they weren't able to pass the budget because, as I understand it, the mm -hmm. EFF councillors didn't actually, you know, come and vote. So, so it's messy. And, and to my mind, the ANC's great risk of a deal with the EFF is that you're doing a deal with one person, only mm -hmm. doing a deal with Julius and no one else. And let me just explain how important this is. Um, years and years ago, there was a party called the African Independence Congress. They're still around. And they did a deal in, with the ANC in Ikuruleni to give them a majority there. And what they want is they want Matatiel, the border, the, the provincial border around Matatiel in KwaZulu-Natal moved. And, um, and so the ANC was able to split that party down the middle. They just split it. They go in, they speak to people, come and join us, vote this way, vote that way. You can't do that with the EFF because it's a deal with one person. And so you don't want to do a deal with one person. One person can say, support Russia or do this or do that, or I'll take Gauteng away from you. You don't want that deal. You want a different deal to that. Sherry Lynn is asking, uh, would you like to comment on the opinion of ya the young vote? Uh, how might they focus on different issues? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's always every election, a lot of talk about all the young vote change things and the young people do the same thing that they've done in every election since 1999. They don't vote. Um, and it's easy to, you know, come down quite hard on young people for that. The fact is, in most mature democracies, young people don't vote. Voting is something you do from 35 plus. Mm -hmm. And I realize I'm going gray and my forehead is bigger than I used to, than it used to be. But that's just the way of the world. Um, it is why, by the way, Britain voted to leave the European Union and did the wrong thing, because older people voted uh, more than younger people. And younger people are the ones who have to live with the consequences. Such is the way of life. The only thing that can change is if the right party or the right candidate comes along. In the classic case is Barack Obama, um, where, you know, and, and, and let me just talk a little bit about why turnout matters. Um, for a long time in the United States, only about 50 percent of, of people had voted in presidential elections. Um, Obama came along, 60 percent of people voted because young people wanted to vote for him. They wanted that change. In his second election in 2012, we went back to 50 percent. Last in 2020. Um, when it was Trump versus uh, uh, Biden, almost every single American who could vote voted hmm. because of the candidates, because of how close it was. Oh, so Donald hmm. Trump in that election got more votes in the presidential election than any other single person ever in American history, apart from Joe Biden in that one election. Hmm. It's astonishing. Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, uh, Terence is asking, how long do you think Sol Ramaphosa will remain ANC and South African president <laughs> under scenarios where the ANC either secures 45 plus or 45 minus? Uh, I, I was going to say that you should read your column in the Daily Maverick <laughs> this morning. Uh, you do you do say something about that. <laughs> Interestingly as well, uh, Stephen, that Justice wrote a piece yesterday basically saying that mixing or uh, talking to people in the economic hub, there was a lot of always uh, talk about the DA. And he sees how in the last couple of months, everybody's focusing uh, on uh, the, the the president of the ANC, not the mm. ANC, but Ramaphosa himself. Yes, yes. Well, look, it's always nice to contribute to engineering news, Terence. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> there are a few things to this. Um, there's been this kind of idea that the ANC does badly, so this is a scenario, the ANC does badly in the election, forced to go into a coalition, they go into a coalition with the EFF or someone like that, Cyril Ramaphosa decides to resign. And I've given this a lot of thought, and it seems to me that first you have to start off with this, what is the ANC doing badly? Okay, so yes, you could say going below 50% is bad. But if everyone's expecting the ANC to get 45% and the ANC gets 48%, that's a good result for Ramaphosa. If the ANC is expected to get 48% and gets 45%, that's a bad result for Ramaphosa. So it's not just a one figure. It's what the expectation mm -hmm. is. At the same time, the research came from Professor Leila Patel, uh, Center for African Development at the University of Johannesburg yesterday, that really shows how Ramaphosa was still more trusted than the ANC. And then, and I need to get quite detailed here, it's quite technical, but then you have to look at what happens after the election. So, to my mind, the question of who the ANC goes into a coalition with and the question of who the leader of the ANC is are completely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. They go like this. To put it another way, I can't see the DA going into a coalition with the ANC with Paul Machatile as the leader of the ANC. OK, if you see that, it's almost the same as saying that Julius Malema can't go into a coalition with Sura Ramaphosa. Slightly different, but almost the same. Mm -hmm. So then after the election, you've got 14 days. So what the Constitution says is we vote on the Wednesday. From 14 days after the election is proclaimed by the Electoral Commission, so the Saturday or the Sunday, let's just say the Sunday. From that moment, the clock starts to tick. You've got two weeks. MPs in those two weeks have to be sworn in by the chief justice they have to elect a speaker and a deputy speaker and at their first meeting the constitution says they must elect a president now in 14 days you're telling me the ANC is going to sort out its leadership issues and change its leader and sort out a coalition and elect a president in 14 days mm, i don't see it it's just too much to do um unless the resigns now, the likely scenario in that case is that if he goes to the NEC and says, look, bad results, done. What would be better for the ANC is if they were to say to him, 
We hear you, Mr. President. Could you please, can we elect you as president? Could you appoint a cabinet? We'll, we'll do that for you. And in three months, go. But let's do this now. Remove the time. Remove the time pressure. Let's get you installed. We'll hold off on the inauguration, but you'll take an oath. And then we'll go from there. Much better transition than something dramatic. And the fact is that I don't see Paul Machatila having the support in the ANC to make himself president at this point, And I don't know who else could take over. That's how I see it. Unless, I mean, it would require the most unbelievable political choreography to make it happen in 14 days. David Maggior, who I know is a journalist from Italy, is asking, do you think foreign policy issues, notably Gaza, Israel, will have an impact on uh, this election, this vote? Mm. So to an extent, and I know there's been a lot of conversation around, you know, is the ANC going to win the Muslim vote? The Muslim vote in South Africa is 2% of the population. Mm. It's a tiny percentage. Um, a significant percentage of that will vote for Al-Jamaa anyway, because it is a party with an, an explicitly Muslim identity. Even though its most public leader, the mayor of Jobo Cabello Guamanda, believes in gay marriage. Anyway, um, you know, such are the contradictions. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> it is astonishing. So, so, so I don't think it may, it's significant in terms of religion. And it's important to remember that um, only one Muslim majority country is backing our action at the International Court of Justice, Egypt. The rest are not. You know, mm. I mean, that's important. Um, what it does do, though, is that it is that the the resonance between being black and South African and Palestinian with Israel is almost completely alike. I don't know if you've ever been been there, Russell, but but you know, I remember going there twelve years ago now and more. Um, and someone, you know, a Palestinian telling me about how he was allowed into Israel if he had a letter from his employer. I mean, it's just mm. mind blowing how similar it is to apartheid South Africa, like on almost every level. So that resonance does help the ANC. It also reminds people that South Africa is a player on the global stage doing the right moral thing because of the ANC. Now that's got to be good for the ANC, but it's not a religious issue, if you see what I mean. Uh, chance of violence, uh, Mike's asking, and claims of stolen elections, if Zuma or other camps are not happy yeah. with the outcome, I guess this is specifically in KwaZulu-Natal. We know that the province is volatile anyway. Um, your thoughts around yeah. violence? So I was quite concerned about it a little while ago, and I did write about it, and Senator Mkunu, a man who knows the province very well, uh, he's a water affairs minister, actually came on, on national radio and said that, that he believed there needed to be more security in KwaZulu and Natal. And he said it almost unprompted. So I thought that was a very significant comment. That was about three months ago now. It kind of depends. You know, you can't really inflict violence if you don't have a lot of support to do it. Now, we know that Jacob Zuma had support. We know what happened in 2021. So that's going to be there. I'm not going to say this will happen or that won't happen. I do think that authorities will be much better prepared for anything. I also think that Zuma has lost some legitimacy since then, and I don't see widespread support in a way that would lead to that. You know, yes, he's promising people, um, you know, two-thirds majority, and everyone knows, not, like, no one thinks that's going to happen, you know. Um, and then also the splits in the, in the MK party are important. These things matter, you know. It goes back to what uh, uh, Justice was saying earlier about organization in the EFF. Organization really matters. It's crucial. So I don't at this point, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised by how peaceful KZN has been up until this point. The danger moment is always after the election. And the Electoral Commission has said, I don't know if they said it on the record, but I don't think they'll mind me saying this. I mean, they said this years ago, that the dangerous point in an election, if you look at where, where there's been violence in the elections, it's when you have the election, you start to get information coming out um, about the counting. And then that information stops. That's when you have the violence. And that's not going to happen here. Uh, you know, the election, the results will keep coming until they're, they're complete. Um, so so that, I don't worry about that. In terms of a sort of stolen election, I think that someone like Jacob Zuma is always going to say that. I mean, he's always the victim. He's always shame he didn't get to finish his presidency. Shame he didn't get to be a dictator for six months. Shame. Um, so, so he's always going to say that, but I don't know how it's going to land. And then it also depends on how, you know, what happens with the other parties. So we need to wait for the result. You know, 
some things you just can't predict one way or another. You need to wait for the results. Ashley's asking, as a Pira's cartoon of the Constitution on fire uh, asks my question, what implications for the big picture of a slide to nutcase territory like Trumpism? <laughs> <laughs> so, gosh, okay. Let me make a couple of comments about the Constitution first. Because the Constitution requires, because to make big changes to the Constitution, you require at least a two-thirds majority. If the sort of Friedman scenario, if I can call it that, of moving towards lots of smaller parties and no dominance by bigger parties is correct, then the Constitution is actually likely to stay as it is for a really long time. It would have to be a very popular issue that, you know, it can't just be a deal between two parties that gets to two thirds majority to change, uh, you know, land expropriation without compensation, for example. You would actually need to have something completely different, something really popular to get your two thirds majority. So we might find that the Constitution stays largely intact for quite some time to come, which is a very good thing, by the way. Hooray. Um, in that case, populism. For four years, I worked as a very young journalist in the early 2000s, and I could not have predicted to you then it would become as inward, as sort of dull, kind of odd as it's been. There are signs in Britain that British politics is going back to a kind of historical kind of normal, whatever that is, um, but that kind of nuttiness is sort of moving away. I hope the same happens in the US. I can't say that it will. I will tell you this, though. That I think South Africans are allergic to a dictator because of our history. They're allergic to any kind of oppression. And the only way, like any kind of person who could come along who could do that, what would give them legitimacy is if they could promise comprehensively to make South Africa safer and reduce violence. That would be the way they would have to do it. So you're talking about a Duterte figure from the Philippines where he literally went around shooting drug dealers. I don't see South Africans going for that kind of thing because the memory of apartheid is just too strong for the moment. But the only thing that would give someone like that legitimacy is the fight against crime, because crime is so scary. There's two questions here. Uh, we've got two minutes to go. Um, uh, uh, what impact, uh, Tony's asking, is the three ballots going to have as it will be for regions? Yes. So, so, so that's to accommodate independence. It's a very strange mm -hmm. system. Um, in my view, what happened, and I said this, um, I, I try not to give too much opinion on SAFM, but I said this very clearly because I thought it was important for, for people to, to sort of see it, in my view. Um, what, the, what the political parties did in Parliament is they didn't want independence, and so they ganged up on the independence and made a ridiculous system. And they were wrong to do that, and I blame the ANC and the DA together for doing that. And, and frankly, mm. as voters, we should punish them for it. It's undemocratic to do that. Whatever, despite whatever they say. So we have this quite strange system where you have a national ballot where you vote for parties, you have a regional ballot um, where you sort of vote for candidates, and then you have your provincial ballot. I think what it's likely, it, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact because I think most people vote for the same place. And there's lots of data that shows, you know, the number of votes that the ANC gets in Gauteng is the same for the national election and the same for the provincial election in Gauteng. You know, and you can go and you can see that data from previous elections, it's there. There are there, there's some changes, but but really almost everybody votes for the same two parties, for the same party. That will start to change though, because of smaller parties and independents and people will start to look at giving you know certain people a chance in a province before they go national, the other way around or whatever it is. So there'll be a, a slight variation there. It might well have an impact on the timing. Almost every election where we voted on the Wednesday has seen it being proclaimed on the Saturday afternoon. Um, the IC, I think, is going to try hard to do that again, but they have said because of three ballots that, that it might take us to Sunday. And so we might have a delay. And they've also never done three ballots before. So so while I think they'll have tested their systems well, you know, it, it adds to, to it adds to the chances of a longer delay. Um, last question. Uh, what do you think are the chances of Rise and Zion? Do you think voting for a smaller party like Rise is a wasted vote? Okay, I'm going to say a couple <laughs> of things here. I think, and I've been laughed out of several rooms for saying this, but I still hold to it. I think there is a significant number of white people who voted for the DA under Musi Maimani. I think they feel uncomfortable voting for a white person because of our history. And I think they're looking for a person that they can vote for and feel almost free of their apartheid baggage. 
big thing to say. I think Sungezo Zibi and Musi Maimani fit that bill. And I think that's very interesting. I think they will gain votes, I mean, perhaps particularly Rise Mzanzi, at the expense of the DA. You can tell during an election who people are scared of because they attack that person. And John C. and Hazen spend more time attacking Rise Mzanzi than most of the other small parties. And I thought that was very revealing. He'll be doing that off polling data, right? Now, in a way, your question is a vote for a smaller party a wasted vote? If I could decode your question a little bit, is you may be saying, should I vote for a smaller party or not? And let me give you a slightly American West Wing answer. Don't think too much about the tactics. Vote for the party that best expresses the way you think and your beliefs and your values so that you are heard in a legislature or in parliament and ignore the rest would be my advice. And what that means is that when that person stands up for you, they may not get to stand up very much, but at least someone is standing up for how you, for what you believe, never mind the tactics. Because once you start getting into tactics, you end up with a burning flag. Stephen Curtis, thank you very, very much uh, for your time tonight. Uh, and of course, to, to Justice, it's been a great uh, conversation. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, we will uh, have one more of these dialogues. Uh, this is the second. The third one will be next Tuesday evening. We're really talking about uh, faith and the role that religious communities play uh, and have played in the question uh, of uh, voting and what is happening now uh, in religious uh, communities. We'll have uh, Father Peter John Pearson and we will also have Joanne Joseph with us uh, next uh, Tuesday evening. So you don't have to, if you are online, it's the same link. You don't have to get a new link from us. You can just log on with the same link uh, that you used uh, this evening. So once again, Stephen, thank you so much uh, for your time. I, I owe you uh, a, a bottle of uh, something. I think I know what, uh, but uh, really appreciative uh, that you took time to be with us this evening. And I wish everyone a very uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.